Yeah, all right. Um, welcome everyone to this week's Origins uh, seminar. Thanks for joining. Um, today we have uh, Matthew Kenworthy of Leiden Observatory. Uh, Matthew was a, uh, he got his PhD from the University of Cambridge, um, and then came to uh, uh, Stuart, I believe, in 1999, spent a few years in Cincinnati, back to Stuart, and then uh, settled in the Netherlands, where he's now an uh, associate professor at Leiden Observatory. Um, Matt tweeted out about a month ago, I think, that he, uh, he's happy to give uh, colloquia or talks and seminars. So I responded to him asking if he uh, wanted to give an origins talk and he was, he was uh, happy to do so. So we're very happy to have him, uh, uh, have him here today. Apart from being a, a great scientist and a, a wonderful teacher, I think, in Leiden, he's also a, a very talented goalkeeper. I remember some uh, games at the Leiden Observatory uh, football tournament, it was very hard, uh, very hard to beat Matt's team, uh, but we can talk about that, uh, that later. I want to ask for, um, uh, to keep your sort of longer questions, uh, uh, leave those for the end, but if you have a short clarification question, uh, use the raise hand feature and then uh, me or Serena will, uh, uh, will point that out to, uh, to Matt. Uh, but, all right, Matt, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, can you uh, still all hear me? Is that working out? Fantastic, thank you very much. So uh, uh, thank you again for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, some of you will have seen bits of this talk uh, before last year, but it's now got a few updates. So uh, my main bread and butter work here at Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands is uh, trying to do direct imaging of exoplanets and uh, designing coronagraphic optics to increase our chances of actually seeing reflected or emitted light from these planets. Uh, this is a side project which has grown to take up more and more of my time in a really fun way. And so what I want to convince you by the end of this talk is that we can see the transits of circumplanetary disks and by searching for these uh, in uh, archival data sets and in future projects, we should be able to find out much more about the physical properties of uh, planet formation and moon formation within those circumplanetary disks. So the picture I hope you're all seeing is of a storm approaching Sutherland Observatory in South Africa, where we built one of uh, two observatories to monitor uh, the light curve of Beta Pictoris uh, two years ago. So anyway, uh, let's see if I can work. Okay, did it click onto the next slide? Yes. Can you see the second slide? Great. Okay, good. So uh, one of the main drivers uh, for NASA and the other big space agencies is, you know, we want to find uh, rocky exoplanets orbiting around nearby stars, uh, and then we can uh, image them and potentially look for biosignatures. So basically search for uh, rocky exoplanets, which uh, have the correct distance away from their parent stars that you can have liquid water existing on their surfaces, as we think that liquid water is uh, a major solvent, you know, a very useful solvent in the process or in many life processes. But if you fly away from the solar system and look back and try and image the Earth or Mars in the habitable zone, uh, which is this uh, magical zone where you can have liquid water on the surface, if you look at optical light, the reflected light is extremely challenging. You're talking about one part in uh, 10 million to one part in a billion is the optical reflected light fraction for, uh, for optical light from the surface of the Earth. So, you know, if you sort of step back and have a look around the solar system and say, well, hold on a minute, you know, are there any other places that we could potentially find life or life is amenable? You notice that the gas giants have, first of all, all the gas giants in the solar system have moons. Furthermore, they all have multiple moon systems. And finally, several of these, you know, one of the moons has an atmosphere. Several of the moons are icy moons where we know that they've got an icy surface, but they've probably got a liquid ocean underneath. And with internal tidal heating, they've got heat sources. These might be uh, appropriate places to look for life or try and see biosignatures as well. So there's been a push for the past decade or so to see if we can detect um, exomoons uh, in uh, orbiting around gas giant exoplanets. And one of the biggest pushes being done by David Kipping and his group at uh, the University of Columbia. And this was using the hunt for exomoons to try and find uh, 
not to the not directly detect the exomoon itself, but basically see variations in the transit timing of the gas giant as it transited in front of its parent star. So he and his group took all the uh, Kepler stars where you have uh, a Jupiter with an orbital period of less than 50 days, and they looked for transit timing variations. And they did this incredibly thorough job in a series of papers. And what they're able to do was basically put an upper constraint of uh, nothing bigger than a Ganymede around any of these uh, gas giant planets. So a really, really amazing effort. More recently, they've had tantalizing evidence that they might be seeing a transiting moon uh, a binary planet or um, exomoon system, but the trick is that they have to wait until uh, the next eclipse is lined up and getting HST data because you require really precise photometry for this confirmation. And also uh, Rene Heller is amongst one of many people who've been really pushing this idea of habitable zones around the exoplanets themselves, around the gas giant exoplanets. So uh, when we, uh, you know, we start with, you know, this kind of uh, thought picture of, you know, a cold cloud condensing down into a star, the residual angular momentum forms a circumstellar disk. And then within that, you form little seeds for planets. Uh, you form these protoplanetary uh, cores and, you know, conservation of angular momentum is you've got to dump uh, the excess momentum somehow. So you form a smaller circumplanetary disk which surrounds the uh, protoplanet itself. And sooner or later, the, uh, and sooner or later, the gas funneling onto that circumplanetary disk should evaporate. So in my head, I have this very simple picture of you have a planetary core, you've got the circumplanetary disk surrounding it. And at some point, the circumstellar material is blown away or you know, is either blown away by the uh, pressure from the radiation pressure from the central star. And so that stops filling up the circumplanetary disk. The material in the circumplanetary disk starts, you know, continues to accrete into the planet or is evaporated away, or it forms little uh, seeds for, ex for moons to form. And so for a certain period of time, you'll have this very large hill sphere structure with tracks carved in it as these moons are forming and they're vacuuming, they're basically pulling out all the gas and dust and forming themselves. But at some point, all that material evaporates and so you're left with a gas giant planet with moons around them and the cross section, you know, the, uh, the optical cross section drops down by a factor of uh, 40,000 or so. So the disks disappear and you've got very little chance of seeing the moons in transit themselves. So, you know, uh, planet formation is a very, very rapid, is a relatively rapid process. It happens in the first, you know, 1 million to 20 million years. So if we do want to see these kind of transits, then we need to be looking at young stars. And so this is where I got involved because doing direct imaging of exoplanets, we're trying to see them glowing with their thermal em energy in the two to five micron band. And what you need is a large catalog of nearby young stars because if the star is young, the planet is young, the planet is glowing, we can detect it uh, with our telescopes and coronagraphs. And so I turned to uh, an expert in the field, Eric Mamajak, and so he's been, uh, he's been leading this kind of study of looking for young stars in, uh, uh, young, uh, in uh, OB associations. And so what he and his then graduate student, Mark Picot, did was that they identified 200 new uh, pre, you know, uh, 200 very young stars in SCOSEN. And this was before the first Gaia data release came out. Now you can just type in a query to the Gaia database and uh, pull all these stars out. But he did it, they did it by selecting by common proper motion and then using uh, spectroscopy to look for the lithium absorption. So in very young stars, uh, lithium burns very, very quickly. Um, but there's not enough time for a young enough star for all the lithium to disappear. So if you see lithium absorption uh, towards a, a young star, then you know, that's a good indicator of youth. One of the stars uh, in this particular uh, group was called J1407, just a contraction of its uh, coordinate positions. And this is about a 17 mega year old star sitting slap bang in the middle of Skosen. Uh, its distance is exactly in the middle of the cluster, it's about 0.9 solar masses, and it looks like a completely unremarkable uh, pre, pre main sequence star just drifting down onto the main sequence. So, one of the other things you can do for youth 
is uh, young stars are rotating rapidly. Uh, you know, for the sun, it's about 28 to 30 days. For these young stars, it's from two to five days. So what happens is if the stars are spotty, the spots rotate in and out of our field of view. And if the spots are relatively long lived, then the light curve from the star is modulated by the rotation uh, of the star. So if you monitor the star for several days, you can see a periodicity and then you can deduce what the rotational period is. So of course, we've been looking at lots of stars uh, for different reasons, the transit, uh, uh, method, transit detection method, finding lots and lots of uh, transiting exoplanets uh, since the first ones in 1999 and 2000. So what we have here is a brief model showing a star moving across the disk, sorry, a, a planet moving in front of the disk of its star, and you typically have a drop of one to two percent for a Jupiter-sized planet uh, over several hours. And so there have been many, many uh, ground-based surveys uh, two of which, you know, one of which has been very successful is the SuperWASP uh, survey, and there's also been the Kelt survey and the HAT survey. And what they use are uh, relatively small apertures, but covering a large solid angle of the sky, taking uh, rapid uh, photometric data, usually every 30 seconds, using these uh, sports camera lenses. And they have successfully found many hundreds of hot Jupiter transits. And so one of these is the SuperWASP. Uh, network and this is the one in uh, South Africa and also there's been an all-sky automated survey which has been going for a much longer time but at a much lower, ca lower cadence. This is the all-sky automated survey and they're looking for uh, uh, variable stars which are changing on the order of several days. So uh, this part of the story is Mark goes off, looks at these two databases, and digs out the light curve for this star, J1407. And he goes into Eric's office and he says, there seems to be something wrong with J1407. So this is data from about 2000 to 2010. Um, the red points are the All Sky Automated Survey, the blue points are SuperWASP, and basically something weird happens to J1407. And hopefully the animation isn't too bitty on this, but as you zoom in to May, April and May uh, 2007, you see that there is this very complicated eclipse which occurs over about 56 days. So what you see is off to the left, you see the red point starting dipping down and this light curve dips down a little bit, goes up, dips down a bit more, goes up, then drops off, it disappears for about a week, so the star's extincted by 95%, and then it pops up and this a light curve is almost time symmetric. And the star, unfortunately, has done nothing ever since. It's been monitored by uh, several groups, and this star has just rumbled along with a 5% variation due to rotational modulation every 3.2 days or so. So uh, uh, this was published by Eric and Mark in 2012. I had a very, very good uh, graduate student, Tim Van Verkoven, who cleaned up this light curve for various reasons. There are little systematic offsets. It turns out that this star hit the corner of three of those eight cameras from the, pic from the other picture you saw. And so we had three separate light curves from three separate cameras and uh, computer control and uh, camera controls. And it turns out that the photometry agrees beautifully once you calibrate it. And what you see is that the light curve uh, flickers up and down uh, the, these little skinny vertical black boxes are essentially one night, one 24 hour period at uh, salt, uh, at the salt site. And you can see that this star is flicking on and off over several hours and it keeps on going uh, we, day, week after week, uh, day after day. You can see these completely strange uh, patterns. It's extremely well approximated by straight line fits, followed by sharp, relatively sharp inflection points. And one of them I'd like to point out is this uh, uh, gradient here, this very steep gradient. It's a 50% change flux of the star in about four hours. So that's staggering. So how on earth do you switch a star on and off that quickly and keep it going for 56 days in a row? So you go through uh, all the basic explanation, all the simple explanations first. So most of the stars we see in the sky are in binary systems. So could this be a binary system and we just don't see the secondary component? Uh, basically, no. If there's a normal solar type star, main sequence star, and you have, let's say, a red dwarf or a brown dwarf of some type, there's no way you can get 95% eclipse by having it move in front of the star. 
Uh, can it be, uh, let's say, a system where the primary star was far more massive, uh, evolved and became a compact source, uh, and the second star turned into a red giant or something like that? Basically, no, there's no way the system looks, has all the hallmarks of youth. Um, it's way too young for a neutron star or a white dwarf to have formed. And also, there's no strong X-ray source in this direction. This has been detected in x-rays, but it's totally consistent with chromospheric emission from a rapidly rotating young star. So it's not that kind of system. Um, going further afield, could it be a circumbinary or a circumstellar disk? Uh, no, there's not enough near-infrared access. Basically, this star looks chromospheric all the way out through to the wise bands. There is no excess above what we'd expect. And secondly, there's no way you can put a circumstellar disk around and make it reproduce the eclipse structure, the rapid variation, followed by long periods of no eclipse whatsoever. So the next, uh, the least ludicrous answer that Eric and I discussed was that we're seeing a ring system. So what we're seeing is that there's a secondary companion which we can't detect. That secondary companion is surrounded by a big circum, circum secondary or circumplanetary disk. This disk has ring-like structures within it, and we're seeing the shadows of those rings transit in front of the star. Now, does this work? So first of all, if you remember, there was that light curve I showed you with a very steep gradient. You can basically say, OK, how quickly do we need to move an opaque occulter across the diameter of the star, which we know reasonably well, uh, in order to dim the star by you know, that gradient, to induce that gradient? And basically, it's 33 kilometers per second. So the orbital velocity of Earth around the sun. So if you take 33 kilometers per second and you multiply it by 56 days, you basically get a structure which is 0.8 AU in diameter. This is the size of Venus's orbit. This is a huge structure. And furthermore, it's got coherent, dynamically cold-like looking uh, features all the way through down to time scales of about half an hour. So it's a large, intricate structure. And I can't really avoid this interpretation. And this is a headache for me. So um, I was looking at the light curve. I was trying to work out there must be a way of working out if it was an azimuthly symmetric ring system. Is there some way we can take this light curve and invert it to get the ring structure? And I think there is. So I'll do this example. So what we have here is the star J1407 is a finite sized source. And we've got one single ring edge here, uh, this blue ellipse. And when the star moves behind at roughly constant velocity behind one edge, the light curve drops very quickly and the light curve gradient is steep. However, the same ring on the opposite side when it emerges, because of the geometry of the ring, the light curve is much more shallow. And because of that, that encodes the relative tip and tilt of the ring systems, even if you don't know the actual optical transmission from one ring to the next. So what I did was I went off and then went back to that original light curve and fit a straight line gradient to each of the lines that, to all of the data, and you get about 36 gradients. And this is a plot of them. So on the x-axis, you've got the steepness, the light curve gradient, and on the y-axis is time from the center of the eclipse. And if you're looking at your computer screens and you squint a little bit, you'll notice that all the gradients on the left-hand side are slightly higher than the gradients on the right-hand side. Now, what you can then do is you say, OK, let's make a ring system which is opaque, transmissive, opaque, transmissive, opaque, transmissive, like the target uh, symbol. Uh, so there's a certain maximum rate at which you can go from that you can generate the steepest light curve gradient because you're going from completely transmissive to completely opaque, given the geometry of the system. And it turns out it's an analytic function. So basically, if this ring system was opaque, clear, opaque, clear, opaque, clear rings, all the, all the photometric, all the gradients I'd measured would lie on this black curve. So, but if you're going from a light gray ring to a dark gray ring, then the gradient is proportionally smaller. So it's so all the ring point, all the ring gradients have to either lie on this black curve or underneath it. And that's a constraint. You can then solve for the tip and tilt of the ring system. And once you've got the geometry and the impact parameter fixed, you can then go back out and solve for the transmission of each of the rings. And so that's what I did. So this is an animation. Uh, everything is to scale. The star's diameter is to scale with the rings. And what you see underneath is the uh, data, the black and yellow points, 
and then you see the orange line which is the model fit moving underneath and so I'll fit I'll fire this off and what you should notice is that as we go along you can see the orange line sort of hits most of the points we have a ring gap the photometry goes back up to one and you can see that the orange line does a pretty good job it's not perfect there are a few points where it misses but basically given an incredibly simple uh, model we get a reasonably good fit okay so now this is the more honest version of that animation the gray areas are where we have no photometric data this was sitting in a database uh, for five years before uh, mark pulled it out pulled the light curve out and i can easily see that this would have just been dismissed as some kind of weird uh, variable star but what you see is the gray areas where there's no photometry and the different colors of uh, red, are different opacities of red are corresponding to the transmission you get. Now you need a bare minimum of 24 rings to accommodate all the inflection points you see in the light curve. I fit it with 36 rings and even then it's not perfect. And basically there's not enough photometric coverage to get a complete unique solution. So. I went, uh, okay, that's close enough, and the referee didn't complain about it, so I was happy as a clown. So with this ring system, if you're with me so far, um, you see that gap, and I immediately said, aha, okay, what kind of mass planet or moon would you need to clear out and carve out that gap, If assuming this is kind of a hill sphere filling uh, system? And it turns out you need a Mars mass exomoon to carve out a gap 60 million kilometers out from J1407b. And if you assume that the rings are the same uh, dust de density uh, as uh, Saturn's rings, then basically the whole mass of the system is about an Earth mass of dust. So it's not completely ludicrous. The, this is, it seems to hang together um, given the very simple minded model. However, many, many issues remain uh, with this system. So uh, we, I have dug through with some very, very patient collaborators trying to find all the photometry we can of J1407. Uh, it's bright enough that we could actually see it um, uh, with the DASH photographic archive. So we've got photometry going back 100 years. Um, but the non-detection, we don't see any other eclipse, uh, which means that if it's on a bound orbit, this is a highly eccentric system. So the, so the planet plus the ring system we're probably seeing it at periastron where the solid angle is largest. Um, this is a real headache. It doesn't hang together. Uh, but Stephen Rieder, who, was a, who is now a researcher at the University of Exeter, was very patient with me and did some simulations where we made a prograde set of rings and a retrograde set of rings. The prograde set of rings on an eccentric orbit planet get ripped apart very quickly the retrograde rings actually kind of hang together and it sort of works if you squint at it. So we've got a retrograde ring system to add the, to the list of impossibilities here. Uh, as correctly pointed out by Zanazi and Dong in 2016, um, the ring system should be coplanar with the tidally distort, rotationally distorted planet, but at some point the tide of the star comes out and so the ring system should be warped. Given that I fitted a, fat, a flat plane model, yeah, it's wrong. I know it's wrong. I still don't understand what this light curve is. Uh, we have a photometric monitoring campaign by many, many very, very uh, hardworking, unpaid astronomers. Uh, so AAVSO have been following this up and uh, uh, Josh Hampsh uh, has been using his robotic telescope to great effect. And so we've got a beautiful series of photometry. We don't see any other eclipse. Um, uh, we also use 100 years of the DASH data. I had uh, Robin Mental, who was an uh, undergraduate student, came over and worked in the summer of 2017. We took all this beautiful data, period folded it. We can't completely rule everything out, but you know, maybe the orbital period's around 17 to 23 years or something like that. We're still looking for it. So having completely failed to detect the secondary companion, uh, we then, uh, me and my collaborator said, well, okay, maybe we can see the rings themselves, right? This is finely ground up dust. It's probably being heated by the star and the secondary companion. So let's try for ALMA. So we wrote an ALMA proposal for cycle zero. It got turned down. 
uh, we wrote a proposal for cycle one that got turned down as well. Cycle two to turn down. Cycle three, I got bored and I missed it. Cycle four, I wrote it and I got the proposal through. So my very patient ALMA experts went off. We got the data. We got an ALMA pointing. We calculated it should be something like 80 microjanskis for a ring system around J1407B. Uh, we get this image back. So this is uh, the ALMA field of view zoomed right in. Uh, you don't see the star J1407 itself. Its chromospheric, its chromospheric emission is not seen by ALMA. Uh, the triangle is where J1407 was back in 2007 during the first eclipse. And then the proper motion of J1407 has carried it to where the square is. And we see a source. So my collaborators emailed and said, we've got a source, it's about 80 microjanskis. And I started yelling and running around the office like an idiot. Well, like more of an idiot. So there's a source there. It's the right brightness. There's nothing else nearby. Fantastic. It turns out it's not quite in the right place for it to be a bound companion to J1407. So you see a white solid ring and two dotted rings there. So remember the gradient which I highlighted back in the first slide? That steep gradient is about 33 kilometers per second transverse velocity. 33 kilometers per second transverse velocity times 10 years since the eclipse happened equals the right ring radius. So if this is a free floating thing going through SCOTN, the white ring is where it would be if it was going at 33 kilometers per second for 10 years. The spatial resolution of ALMA is so damn good, it allows us to nail it down. It turns out the error bars are the two dotted rings, and the reason is we don't know the radius of the star that well. That's the limiting factor in all of this calculation. So it could be a free-floating ring system. I see Eric signed on. I know Eric will be rolling his eyes right now about this. Uh, it's almost certainly a background galaxy, but we need another epoch of ALMA data to confirm this. Uh, we got turned down for DDT, and we missed the last, and we failed in the last cycle. So. Another observation with ALMA will either say this is a background source or we've actually got the ring system and it just happens to be free floating through SCOSEN. Both of them are completely nuts, but we'll find out assuming we get a very patient tack. Anyway, this has become my albatross. It hangs around my neck. I can't let it go. Um, you, know, it, you know, when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, it's usually thinking, well, maybe it could be this way around. Anyway. So J1407 is still being photometrically monitored. What we wanted though, I wanted, uh, trans what I wanted was another circumplanetary uh, disk. I was, I'm starting to think, oh, this could be something we could actually chase up. So we have a nearby uh, planet. Uh, the, I believe it is the brightest directly detected, directly imaged planet is Beta Pictoris B. So this is around a fourth magnitude star in the Southern hemisphere. Beta Pictoris is very famous because it's one of the first one of the four IRAS sources which show excessive in, you know, infrared emission. It's got an edge on disk which was uh, imaged in the 1980s by uh, Smith and Tyrrell. Yeah, it's this beautiful prototype object. It's a very young system. There's lots of stuff flying around in it. Uh, uh, imaging using HST show that there are warps in the disk which imply that there's a planet perturbing it. And sure enough, uh, in 2010, Anne-Marie Lagrange and her group published an image of the planet on one side of the star, and then it was recovered a few year, uh, a year or so later, emerging on the other side of the star. So there's this almost coplanar orbit. We're lucky that this star has a planetary system which is almost coplanar with us. Why am I interested in Beta Pic particularly? So Beta Pictoris was used as a photometric reference star until about until 1981, because in 1981 it showed a 6% variable fl fluctuation. So Le Cavalier des Tangs and subsequent papers by uh, his group uh, have analyzed this. So the star brightened up slowly over a couple of weeks, fluctuated rapidly over three or four days, and then started ramping down and fading away again. And so this was way before uh, the planet was known about. So models with Comet tails and forward scattering of dust clouds were proposed, but people were kind of excited when the planet was discovered, saying maybe this is the planet, maybe this is a transit of Beta Pictoris B as we now know it. And certainly, you can see that the planet, uh, you know, it's if you build a high contrast imaging instrument to look for extrasolar planets, um, 
you point at a beta pic torus and take a picture of beta pic b it's kind of the thing you use to get your system calibrated and sure enough you see this uh animation by max miller blanche very nicely shows the star the planet approaching the star towards inferior conjunction and then uh, people were very excited. They analyzed the orbits and uh, Jason Wang, a graduate student at the time, did this beautiful analysis using GPI and a very consistent data set and showed that the planet does not transit the star. So it just misses it by about 20% of the Hill sphere. So a few astronomers were probably, uh, were probably you know, let down by this, but I was delighted because I said, oh, if it's not the planet, then it might be circumplanetary material is moving in front of the star. So the trouble is, uh, if you do the calculation, it takes a long time for the Hill sphere to transit in front of the star. And so if you ask um, larger observatory, do you mind staring at a fourth magnitude star for the best part of the year, you get a very polite but firm no. And so we came up with uh, the looking for exomoons and rings around the Beta Pictoris B, the Bring project. So what this was, was a, a building a small robotic observatory that would just take photometry in order to continuously monitor Beta Pictoris, the star, during the Hill Sphere transit. So how long does this take? Um, so uh, the Hill Sphere itself takes about 270 days to transit, and for the star to cross its own diameter takes about 48 hours so if there's any kind of ring feature in orbit around the planet b it takes about two days for that feature to track cross over the star so we needed longitudinal coverage in order to be able to uh, make sure that we could catch any kind of feature like this so with this de dedicated beta pictoris campaign uh, in leiden we uh, basically copied off the heritage from the mascara all Sky Survey started by Inya Smellen and Gert-Jan Talens, and we basically made a scaled down version of that. We built one of these boxes, we shipped it down to uh, South Africa, uh, to uh, Sutherland in 2000, at the beginning of 2017, and then Eric Mamajek and his then graduate student Samuel Mellon uh, built Bring 2, and they went off to Siding Spring Observatory, where Michael Island uh, very kindly set it up and plugged it in, and we haven't been asked for the uh, internet bill yet. So what happens is that we have two wide field cameras uh, which look, uh, which are optimized to cover the declination of Beta Pictoris at minus 51 degrees. And at these two southern locations, it's just about uh, circumpolar, so circum south pole. So what you get after a couple of weeks is these cameras do not move at all. The sky rises and sets through the fields of view of these cameras and we take six second exposures so that the star trails are minimized and each pixel in each of these two cameras covers about one square arc minute. And so what you get after a few weeks is this reconstructed picture. So Bring sees everything south of about minus 40 degrees in the southern hemisphere and what we're doing it we get all these images and we're just doing it for the photometry of that star. So there's Beta Pictoris there. So when we shipped it down to South Africa, it basically looks like a washing machine with two uh, metal eyes uh, which protect it. Uh, we were right at the southern edge of the telescope plateau at Sutherland, which is about six hours drive out of uh, Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, had a couple of students who are working on it. You can see the, eye, the eyes are open there and you can just about make out the camera lenses inside. And in fact, right behind Blaine, the student on the right, you can see the cover, cover for Super Wasp, I believe, on the right. And I think Kelt is somewhere else in the background there. So, but basically we're the southernmost point and we have a beautiful unobscured view to the south. You have to be careful of the other observers on the plateau though, of course, we've got the Springbok and these weird giant rat creatures are the Desis, which are wandering around the place and look at you very curiously. Uh, we also blew up quite a few Arduinos because people aren't totally truthful about the pinouts for their electronics. And so we melted quite a few bits of electronics before we all got it working, but we we're very happy about it. Uh, the engineer who helped build the, who designed Bring, built it like a tank. You could stand on this thing and jump up and down on it and it wouldn't deflect the alignment at all. And I said to him, this is ridiculous. You've completely over-engineered it. And I believe that until uh, January 2018. 
And so I don't think you'll get the sound for this, but just imagine giant hail falling out of the sky and smashing down on the ground here in South Africa. And this is normally a completely dry riverbed. Uh, this only ha they have one of these showers about once every 10 years. And I think in one second, the person is gonna be brave enough to run outside and pick up some of the hail. And here he goes. And if you, can, if you can't hear it, there's lots of yelling, but basically that's the size of hell that came down for, an, for a two hour storm back in January, 2018. It destroyed several of the all sky cameras, just simply shattered the plastic coverings, destroyed the cameras. With a bit of dread, I emailed them and said, uh, how is Bring doing? And they sent me a photo and it turns out it cleaned Bring rather nicely. And then we started up again the next night. Uh, to add more chaos to this, I got, uh, I think Sam got an email uh, the next year we kept on running the scopes and it turns out that we had a power supply was destroyed because of ants. So it turns out the fluid in electrolytic capacitors in the power supplies ants find rather yummy. They climbed in and shorted out the power supply. If you've ever seen the film phase four, then you know, I had flashbacks to that and we are you know, obeying the ant masters right now. Anyway, so we, we weren't the only people observing uh, Beta Pictoris during this time. There was an observatory called A Step 400, which is in Antarctica on, Con on the Concordia Plateau, led by Tristan Guillot and his group. Uh, we collaborated with uh, Constanza Swintz, uh, who is a member of the Bright Constellation. So these are nanosats, which have been monitoring bright stars for stellar oscillations. She's very kind enough to collaborate with us. And so cumulatively, with the, together with Bring, these three instruments together, give continuous coverage over the hill, complete hill sphere. And the end result was that we didn't see any rapid dips consistent with that 1981 dip uh, uh, seen before. So whatever caused that weird fluctuation isn't there during the hill sphere transit. And indeed the whole sphere, hill sphere transit is very, very clean. There's no noticeable dip during the whole uh, 270 day period. And in fact, the upper limit on the optical death shows that at least during that that cord which cuts across the hill sphere there's probably less than you know a third of a mass of uh, the earth moon assuming it was smeared out evenly we also had an observing campaign uh, led by Ernst de Moy spectroscopic, spectroscopic campaign and we do see variability in the bottom of the calcium h and k lines we're still trying to argue over the interpretation of that but it does seem to be reasonably strongly correlated with the transit. So we think something is going on there, but it's kind of hard to model it and disentangle it out. Meanwhile, uh, TESS was launched and went up and looked at uh, Beta Pictoris. And one of, uh, one of uh, Constanza's students was Sebastian Zeber. And he emailed me and said, oh, by the way, do you know TESS has looked at Beta Pictoris? Should I have a look at it? And I went, yeah, sure, go for it, why not? I had no idea how to reduce the data from TESS. Sebastian sat down, read up all about it, and he emailed me a month later and said, oh, I've done it, I've cleaned up the light curve. And I went, wow, okay, that's, that's brilliant. This is what it looks like. So it's observed in two sectors, and what you see is this horrible fuzz. And what it is, is that Beta Pictoris is ringing like a bell. It's a prototype Delta Scuti pulsator. So this thing has many, many, uh, uh, oscillation modes which are caused by an internal uh, kappa opacity mechanism deep within the star and you look at this light curve and you're just completely blown away by the pulsations and if you zoom in you can see these pulsations they have periods from five minutes to an hour or two but you know Sebastian's supervisor was a world leading expert in delta scuti pulsations that is what uh, Constanza Swin specializes in so she and uh, she and uh, Sebastian modeled them, found 54 identified pulsations, removed them, and this is what the light curve looked like after removing those pulsations. And what you see is this beautifully flat light curve, and you see two dog tooth, shark tooth light curves, uh, uh, transit events occur, occur in this. Uh, TESS every so often has uh, reaction wheel adjustments, so they had to be labeled up. All the red arrows show you where they had to tweak. Uh, the satellite, but basically the, the black arrows 
and then the very large dip at the bottom are transiting events. And what it looks like is it looks like exocomets. We're seeing broadband uh, transits of not the exocomet coma uh, or the heads of the comets, but the actual tail blowing off behind them is large enough and wide enough to block light at about the 0.1 to 0.2% uh, level. And so Sebastian led this really great, really fast paper uh, last year. It was tremendous fun to write it up quickly. Uh, you know, we could fit a simple comet tail model and fit the residuals beautifully out. And the transverse velocity is about 20 kilometers per second. So it's about two AU out. And this beautifully matches the predictions from the Le Cavalier des Etang papers 20 years ago. In fact, we got the same depth and roughly the same transit time as well. So that's just beautiful confirmation of what was suspected. And you know, uh, other comets have been, you know, other comet-like features have been seen by Saul Rappaport and his collaborators by visually inspecting the whole set of light curves in Kepler. So there are about three or four comets every 100 days. Uh, Tess is going to look at Beta Pictoris again in October this year, and, we'll, and Sebastian and his collaborators will be sitting there with the go button, ready to hunt down for any more comets that happen to transit during that time. But if we want to find more transiting ring systems, where should we look? Uh, Gaia DR2 came out and Jorge was a master student who worked with me and he plotted this up and said, there you go, here are all the young stars in SCOSEN, there are about 10,000 candidates. If we put gas giant planets around all those 10,000 candidates with the right power laws found from radial velocity, you know, if we did five year photometric monitoring of all the SCOSEN stars, how many transits would we see and um, around what stellar masses would we see them? And it turns out ring systems you'll see preferentially transiting around uh, smaller mass stars. And given that we've only seen one system, the J1407 system, that implies a ring lifetime of about one mega year. Now, whether this is true or not, or you, know, you can find a theorist who'll say, yeah, that sounds reasonable, and then they'll have a fight with another theorist who says, no, it should disappear on a dynamical timescale. Whatever, at least I think it's one data point on this. So Hill sphere eclipses are far more likely around smaller mass stars, basically because the solid angle of the Hill sphere is much, much larger, grows much more quickly, uh, uh, despite the smaller orbital radii of the planet. So last year, a paper from Saul Rappaport's team came out. Epic 24.3 is an M dwarf eclipser. So this is sitting in a uh, in Kepler data, basically there's this asymmetric uh, transit which occurs and it looks like something like a disk uh, around an unseen secondary companion, which is a few stellar radii in diameter. And then uh, Trevor David discovered another system, a young binary M dwarf system, which has a similar looking kind of eclipsing object. So my grad student, Dirk Van Dam, has just submitted the paper after collecting all the data on this system and we've got orbital constraints on this as well. Notice two asymmetric eclipses, they're both around M dwarf stars, young M dwarf stars. So my goal has been to try and find more of these light curves and constrain ring lifetimes. If we get another system transiting, you can do spectroscopy, you can work out the composition of the rings as they move in front of the stars. So I've been working with, we've been working with the Everyscope team, trying to look through the test database um, both the M stars and J1407 require eccentric orbits. There's enough orbital data to say these can't be circular orbits, otherwise we would have seen them transit again. Is this telling us something about these formation mechanisms? So I was waiting for another exo ring exerting exo ring system to transit back in December, and then this happened. Uh, I'm on Twitter, and I saw this tweet roll by, and it's uh, Zachary Way. Uh, flag down, he's working with the Super Assassin team who are doing all sky monitoring, looking for supernovae explosions. And he tweeted this picture of a nearby star which suddenly started dimming uh, back in December. So this star is pootling along at about 14.2 magnitude and then started precipitously dropping. It's an F5.5, it's called JO600, about 5.166 parsecs away or something. So when I saw this and chatted with Eric about this. This thing has no eclipse in the previous 2,230 days. Um, I think, yeah, okay, it's another ring system. So I posted an alert to AAVSO and I got many, many dedicated unpaid astronomers who have very, who've got these beautiful telescopes to monitor it. You know, this is the Assassin Network uh, who discovered it. 
And then there is uh, Craig Bauer's team at the Perth Observatory. Uh, Edward Gomez very kindly collaborated with me and we're using the Allscar or the All Earth Telescope LCOGT to take great photometry. And uh, David Buckley at SALT has been taking some high resolution spectroscopy of the star uh, as well. And then we have a couple of other uh, observers who have been dedicated to taking uh, photometry of this star over the past few uh, over the past few months. And then uh, TG Tan's photometry is uh, absolutely fantastic. So thanks to all the JL600 observers. I thought that this thing would switch off rapidly. Well, it turns out I need to eat my words again. This sucker just keeps on going and going and going. So you can see this photometry has been cranking away. The star is now setting. Uh, we're going to lose it for the season in another week or so. And this was a photometry from up to last week. And basically we see rich detailed eclipse structure. And what's beautiful is we have multiple bands. I'm showing three of the six bands we've got here and it's definitely eclipsing dust. Uh, we took a direct image with sphere and we see no companion. It's a singleton star just sitting there nearby. So this is completely making us scratch our heads. Uh, Eric center calculation, this thing is now at least 0.7 AU in diameter, we reckon, and the, eclipse, and the eclipse still hasn't finished. So we're still furiously monitoring it. Okay, and with that, uh, I'll uh, leave it at that. And thank you very much for your time. It was great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, any questions? For Matt, I'm just scrolling through the participants. Uh, Everett has a question. Go ahead, Everett. Excellent talk, uh, Matt. Uh, so I was wondering, um, how do you decide whether something is better explained by rings versus a family of exocomets? Like, you know, the and also uh, if you could say anything in relation to like Tabby star. Uh, and sure. Similarities. So, so uh, I, I don't have a great exocomets versus rings discriminant at the moment. The only thing I'd say is that for um, for J fourteen oh seven, when you did it on a linear plot of uh, flux, it, it just it was beautifully fit by straight line fits. Those those are just straight lines with very tight inflection points. And one of the parameters which I never bothered to fit, but I suspect would work, is that the light curve model is excellently reproduced by very sharp edged rings convolved with the uh, limb darkening of the star. So I think you see that those light curves are rounded just a bit at the top and the bottom. I think that's a strong indication that it's straight edges cutting across the disk of the star, or sorry, rather a segment of a very, very large ring edge. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't put in a zoom in of this light curve, but you see those rapid fluctuations uh, from night to night in the JO600 light curve as well. So I'm afraid those are my two indications that it's a ringy transit versus Boyajan star where it's intermittent. Um, it also looks an awful like attack and decay. Those look far more like cometary tails and comas expanding from falling evaporating bodies. So there, the curves seem to be a bit more exponential attack and decay. But to be honest, that's the only difference that I'd, uh, I'd say between infalling comets versus a ring system around a secondary component in the system. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul Callas has a question. Oh, uh, hi, Matt. Great talk. Very interesting uh, results. Um overall and at the end here. Is this a target, this last one, something that you can observe with B-Ring? With B-Ring? Unfortunately, no. It's um, B-Ring only goes down to 10th magnitude and this is 14th or 15th in G. Is this a southern hemisphere target or northern? It is, yes. Uh -huh. So how about Antarctica for um, the summer, our summer, their winter? Oops, uh, sorry, I don't know if you can, let me just see. Yes, they could, they could pick it up. That's an excellent idea. Yeah, the ASTEP, as you know, and, uh, and the Chinese uh, observatory there. Yes, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Paul, yes, good idea.
Uh, Daniel, go ahead. I met great talk, really cool results. I was wondering uh, about uh, systematic searches in the test archive for similar yes. sources. How many how many groups are doing that? Uh, if if any, and um, going through all the data, and how many sources are there for which you expect that uh, they are maybe young enough or associated oh. with young enough sources that uh, oh boy, they could okay, have such? yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I have a master's student who is infinitely patient with me. Um, I he worked with. Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't remember her name. So there was a, uh, a, a PhD student working with Anthony Brown who, who works with Gaia a lot. And she selected all the, she basically has hunted for all the pre-main sequence stars in Gaia, uh, less than 20 million years old. And so she selected out all the stars that are covered. Uh, and she and uh, this master's student, uh, Oh my gosh, I was talking with him today, Schmidt. Oh my God, I'm sorry, I've, I've just totally blanked on his name. But basically, he's pulled out all the test light curves for all the young stars that she's identified. And he's done a manual identification of every single star. And so we've got this big catalog of these are obviously irregular variables. These are obviously periodic uh, binaries. I'm, I'm sure several other groups are doing it, but we haven't talked to them about this. Um, uh, but he basically boiled it down to 20 star, 20 very, very promising light curve candidates. Yeah. And we're working through that list to see if they're believable or not. Uh, the issue with tests, though, is it's not a very long baseline. So you'd have to be lucky yep. to catch a J1407 ring system transiting. But if you're looking at very low mass stars and hopefully with things in very short orbital periods, you hope you cover enough of a duty cycle and orbital period to find one of these things. But we, we don't have anything which is obvious like J1407 from looking at test data alone. And the kind of numbers that we are speaking about here in terms of the uh, master sample, in terms of the age limit and then the magnitude cut for tests, it's probably a 500 or 1,000 stars or? It was something like 30,000 stars. 30,000, okay, great. 30,000 stars okay. and then a subset of that are slowly being covered by TESS. And yes, yeah. Nice, thank you. More questions for Matt? I, I have another question. If. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So I was wondering about extending the wavelengths coverage. You you showed, I think, visual wavelengths data, right? Uh, yes. Do you have ways to get high precision near infrared photometry for? For uh, JO600? Uh, yes, and if you find other sources in the future from the tests. Uh, uh, not ba basically not offhand, unless it, you know, the, the, the trouble is, you know, sort of J1407, was sitting in the data and there's just only one color for J1407, right? There was no other uh, contemporary wavelengths taken. For J0600, we've been very fortunate that we seem to have caught it at the start of the eclipse. And so we have six band photometry all the way through until last week. Uh, uh, Mike Cushing uh, very kindly took an IRTF mid-infrared spectrum, we were looking for, you know, ice absorption and there's nothing there. Um, uh, uh, the salt high resolution spectrum doesn't show anything obvious in the, you know, we, we don't see any other kind of atomic absorption towards this system. It looks dry and it looks just like micron sized dust. Yeah. But it, so th there's no real facility that you could use to get say JH uh, high precision photometry monitoring. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'll be perfectly yep. honest, I've not tried. Yep. All right, uh, we have a question from Lauren Biddle in the chat. Uh, so it says, for beta pick, you mentioned calcium H and K variability occurring in around the same time as the photometric variability. Can you also monitor H and K for the most recent target that you mentioned? Um, yes, and uh, that's a 
that's a really good idea. Um, the spectra from salt, high resolution salt spectra, cover that band, and we don't see any obvious absorption features sitting at the bottom of the calcium H and K. But it's certainly something we can monitor when it comes back out uh, later on this year. Okay, I think if there's no further questions, we should uh, thank Matt again. Cool, thank you very much. Um, Serena might have something 